Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let's open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 8. So much is going on in the world today. Yes. You know, the Bible says that in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars, which we have. There will be earthquakes in various places. Isn't it interesting that we are seeing so many earthquakes, but several in, in, in Mexico, big ones, and then all the aftershocks. We don't know how many aftershocks have come. Many people dead, children dead, 20 uh, children were killed today. Japan had an earthquake. Tsunami is going to be hitting there. Norco had an earthquake <laughs> this morning, 2.9. So um, they're just in various places like Norco and Japan <laughs> and, and Mexico. Um, and then they're predicting that this coming Saturday, right? The world's coming to an end. Yes. Yes. With, with yeah. the moons and stuff. So, so uh, Christina and Fred, sorry. You're not getting married. <laughs> okay, I'm done then. <laughs> You're not getting married. I have to worry about it. The Lord's going to come back right, right when... Uh, you say, I do, and you're gone. <laughs> I do, and there I go. But we know, uh, I know that this church knows, because it's been taught very well, that we don't believe those false prophets that give us dates and times of the Lord's return, because no man knows the days or the hours the Bible teaches us very clearly. Though my heart wish that they were right because <laughs> yes. I'm ready to go but um, chances are uh, we will see you on Sunday morning and the wedding will continue on so <laughs> that would be interesting wouldn't it when I share with the body if, if anyone has any objections speak up now and then the Lord <laughs> takes us all up <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, Exodus chapter 8, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy, Lord. They're fresh in you every morning, and they just extend throughout the day, Lord. Yes, we thank Lord. you, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die you, for us, Lord. Yes. And that you have given us, Lord, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And you have given us a hunger and a thirst to know you, Lord, deeper, yes. to understand your word from Genesis all the way through Revelation, Lord. Lord, if we don't have a hunger for that word, if we feel like uh, it's a chore, Lord, uh, Father, we pray that you would take those things away from us, Father, that we would hunger the, the word of God just as we hunger for food, and that it wouldn't be a chore, Lord, it would be a blessing to read the word of God. And Lord, every word that we read would be exciting to know that the living word of God is being read by us, God's almighty word that will outlast everything it says. Uh, not one word, not one dot, not one little tittle. That means the smallest of little mark on the Hebrew uh, language will pass away, yet heaven and earth will pass away. And so, Lord, what a privilege it is to know your word Amen. and to study your word and to try to understand it, Lord. It is a lifelong journey, Lord, that's always uh, expounding and, and educating us, Father, yes, in our walk Lord. with you, Lord. And so do that tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Gen Exodus chapter 8, this evening's theme is plagues 2, 3, and 4. 2, 3, and 4. I left out the 3 there, but you get it. We have 10 plagues which take place in Egypt and are described in chapters 7 through 12. The plagues were 10 disastrous uh, disasters sent on um, Egypt by God to convince Pharaoh to free the Israelites, slaves, from the bondage and oppression that they had endured for over 400 years. The nation of Israel has been forced into harsh slavery by Pharaoh of Egypt, and God called Moses and his brother Aaron to stand up in the gap and demand that he let God's people go. But God knew it would take much more than that to convince stubborn Egyptian king to let them go. So God uses Moses and Aaron to demonstrate his power through ten 
series of plagues. We will find three plagues tonight in chapter 8. We will see frogs, lice, and flies. Now, who in the world loves frogs, lice, and flies? I don't know of anybody besides a boy who would play with a frog. <laughs> or I guess a girl who would kiss a frog and hope there would be a prince. <laughs> but frogs are like, you know, ugh, I, I don't even want to touch them. Remember when your mom would say, don't touch frogs, they give you warts? Mm -hmm. you know, that's not true. You know? And then who wants lice? Who wants lice or mice or, or, or fleas, you know, mm. or, or mosquitoes, whatever they, they were. Most think that they were lice, but nobody likes lice. That's why Carlos shaves his head. And then he, he never gets lice. <laughs> we had to shave our heads when we were little kids, you know, when we got lice and so forth. And then flies, you know, we all moved to Mariloma, so we must love flies. And then, <laughs> back when the dairies were here, there were a lot of flies that were around. So we're going to see those three plagues here. Uh, the characters in this chapter are definitely God orchestrating this behind the scenes using Moses and Aaron and then, of course, Pharaoh himself. So three points tonight. Battling the enemy. Battling the enemy. From our perspective as believers, how do we battle that enemy? And then a hard heart. As Christians, sometimes we can harden our hearts to the Lord. We can harden our hearts to what God wants to do in our life. We can harden our hearts to other believers who are pouring into us. And then third point, a separated people. A separated people. And what I mean by that is, is that the Israelites were separated unto God, and we are separated unto Jesus. So we are a separated people. All right. So let's look at verses 1 through 5. We're going to do this a little differently, so um, bear with me. Let's read 1 through through seven here. So the Lord spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs so that the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house into your bedrooms, and on your bed, and into the house of your servants, and on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls, and the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt also. First, God prophesies and says, this is exactly what's going to happen. And he gets in pretty much details of exactly where those frogs are going to be. And they're going to be pretty much everywhere. You go to cook your, your uh, chocolate chip cookies and there's frogs in there. You go to make your bed and there's frogs there. You're laying down to take a nap and there's frogs on top of you. And with the slaves and in the quarters and so forth. Frogs are everywhere. And Moses tells Aaron to stretch out his hand. And what happens? Frogs begin to pop up everywhere. Everywhere. And... The magicians decide to show Moses that they have the same amount of power, and so they produce frogs also, which makes no sense. Why would you produce them? You would want to get rid of them, but they actually make more. And of course, Satan doesn't make any sense, and people who are deceived by, by him don't see that either. They're so uh, blinded from uh, his lies. So the battle of the enemy, battling the enemy, battling the enemy. How we battle the enemy. Here we have Pharaoh compromising, uh, <clears throat> or Pharaoh's compromises are types of Satan's, or types of those that Satan uses to attack Christians. Be a, to be a Christian, 
but stay in Egypt or at least don't be so narrow as to come out entirely from the world. So it's a typology of how Satan will try to keep us into the world and not come out of the world. God is trying to remove the, the Israelites from Egypt, which is a type of the world, and Pharaoh is trying to keep uh, Israel in slavery. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. And so there's a battle that's going on in our lives constantly, daily, if not every hour, a battle that we fight against the flesh and the spirit. And we all fight that battle. We all struggle with that. Paul struggled with it in Romans chapter 7 very clearly. Even after 14 years of being in the ministry, the flesh is with us always. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're opposing powers that work in our lives. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want to do, Galatians 5.17 says. So it is a battle to do the right thing. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants to do. The spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature gives us. Those two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And we have that battle and argument within our mind, don't we? Whether we submit to the Lord or whether we submit to the flesh. Amen. It feels so much better to submit to the flesh because sin is pleasurable, Moses said, but it's only for a season. And as believers, we know that sin may be pleasurable. We may find that pleasure in that moment, but ultimately sin will lead to death and destruction. And so we have to choose to follow Christ. And I have found that the more that you serve Christ, the more that you spend time with Christ, the less that you want the flesh in your life. Paul said in Romans 7, I do not understand what I do, for what I do, I do not do, but I hate what I do. And that's the battle of the flesh. So we are engaged in a battle between God's truth and the lies of Satan. And they are lies. They are lies that enter into our minds and lies. Whether we're men, whether we're women, or whether we're children, Satan is there with his demonic forces trying to stumble us. And every Christian knows this. There's a fierce inner battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. The old man and the new man, Galatians 5. If we do not learn how to overcome the strong inner urges to gratify the flesh, sin will take, cap take, take us captive and it will enslave us and we will literally walk away from the Lord. And that is something that we don't, do not want to do. Paul cries out in despair. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? When he cried out in Romans 7. And that battle is severe. It was for Paul. I believe it was for Jesus too. Jesus resisted temptation. He was sinless. And I believe that that temptation was probably a hundredfold stronger than the temptations that we have. And yet he is our example. Not that we're Jesus and not that we can accomplish being sinless, but we are to try to walk as he walked. First, we must understand that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's wonderful. The flesh is with us. It's always with us. It's going to desire the fleshly things. And that's a matter of fact. And we're going to feel condemned when we give in to that flesh. Whatever that can be. For some it's extreme because there are new believers in Christ and they're coming out of things. For the seasoned believer, it may be different. It may be pride. It may be anger. It may be frustration. It may be that he's not getting his way and he just needs to submit himself to God and let God's plan unfold in his life. And that's the work of the flesh. And we need to give in to the spirit. But realize that in all those cases, there is no condemnation. He doesn't condemn us. The wages of sin has already been paid for by Jesus' blood. And we believe that by faith. And that's accounted to us as righteousness. And so we shouldn't feel condemned or we shouldn't feel guilty. We, we should have a convicting spirit 
that says what you're doing is, is not right and you should not do it and then we should give in to the spirit and not do it. But if we stumble and fall, then we need to get back up and keep walking and going forward. We need to do battle daily. Daily. It's, it's a daily battle. And so when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you ought to do is pray to the Lord to give your spirit strength. That you not give in to the flesh. Paul said, I die daily. So begin every day declaring the flesh is dead. It's dead. I don't want it alive in my life anymore. I don't need it alive in my life anymore. It's dead to me. And it should be dead to all. And let the Spirit of God, Lord, reign and rule in my life. And use only spiritual weapons when we go throughout the day. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, Paul says. Exercise your spiritual senses. Bury yourself with spiritual activities. Be in prayer, Bible study, soul winning, giving, fasting, helping needy people, visiting hospitals, working around the church, writing encouraging letters, teaching Sunday school, uh, driving a church bus, etc., etc., go on. In other words, be occupied with the things of the Lord. And if you're working, then be occupied with those things. If you have a job where, where you're on the road, then turn on K-Wave and listen to it all day long. Have your Bible by your side um, in the passenger seat open as you're reading while you're at stoplights instead of your phone or where you're on your break or where you're taking lunch. Have it with you all the time. I used to carry a little pocket Bible. Listen to K-Wave all day long. Pray. Have a list of prayers and start praying for people. Just be busy with the Lord. It's a weapon against the enemy. And when you're so occupied with God's things, you're not occupied with Satan's things. Bathe yourself in Scripture. so important that we read Scripture. I had a neat conversation with uh, Brother Michael uh, this morning just sharing his testimony with me. And... Um, he shared with me that when he came here that I encouraged him to read his scripture. He goes, and no one's ever told me that before. And you just kept saying, read your scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. And so he started reading it. And as he's reading through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and so forth, he's reading these stories. He's like, I've never read that story before. And he grew up in a Baptist church. They never told me about that story before. You know? And that's why I encourage you, read your scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Get into the Word of God. That is where your strength will be. You'll see the stories and, and how these men dealt with the flesh and how they battled the enemy and how God was victorious over those things. A missionary was speaking to an Indian who had become a Christian and he had told him how he was having a battle in his heart like having a white and black bulldog fighting. He said, who wins? Asked the missionary, and the one, he said, the one that I feed the most is the one that you feed the most. And so feeding your spirit, feeding your spirit with the scriptures is feeding that spiritual man and not the fleshly man. So it goes on in verse 8, where Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may make or take away the frogs from me and from my people, and that... I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Entreat, or, uh, which is an unusual word. It, it literally means to intercede for us. And this is the first occasion on which Pharaoh has been really moved uh, to do or even think about letting them go uh, as he sees these frogs just, you know, all over the place. And Moses said to Pharaoh, except the honor of saying, when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your house, that they may remain in the river only. So ask your God to take away the frogs, for those begging Moses at this point, and so you know, because Pharaoh's a, a proud man. Pharaoh's not going to budge or move. And so this thing moved him enough to say, can you ask your God to stop? He recognized God, first of all. And that God's that Moses' God was strong enough to do something like that. So he said, tomorrow. And he said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. 
and the frog shall depart from you, from your house, from your servants, from your people. They shall remain in the rivers only. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the words of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. So you can just imagine how the smell permeated the, the area. I mean, just one frog. I mean, I remember playing with frogs and how they felt so slimy. You know, and they would jump around all over the place and they left this kind of dirty, smelly uh, scent on your hand. Can you imagine millions, if not billions, of frogs all over the place? And they're shoveling them up and heaping them up in the smell that's there. Of course there's going to be lice and flies just on the carcasses of frogs themselves. And God is doing a, a great work here. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, what did he do? He hardened his heart and did not heed as the Lord had said. So, one of those games that Satan plays with you, and it's kind of like the guy who's up on the roof, and he's doing some work, and all of a sudden he... <coughs> starts to fall. He means says, God help me, God help me, God help me. And as he's sliding down the roof, a nail catches his belt and just hangs him up there. And all of a sudden he stops and he says, never mind God, I'm okay. You know, it, it's one of those things where you calling out to God, that God does something, but then you contribute it to chance and to luck. Mm. And so then you think maybe there isn't a God, it just is what's going to happen anyway. You know, that type of thing. That was something that, that I had to um, really refine in my life, was to see the work of God taking place in my life. The world doesn't see it. It happens all the time. And they'll say things like, oh, that's chance, or that's weird that that would happen, or you know, whatever phrases they may use. And, and we have to contribute it to God, that God did it, that he put a wall between us and what could have happened if that wall wasn't there. Or if that car didn't do this. You know, we don't know what angel is protecting us and push, pushing cars away. You know, they may be coming at us. I was on the freeway just the other day. And I turned away. I was on the fast lane. Because that's where you drive with the Camaro on a fast lane. <laughs> <laughs> 65 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> first gear. <laughs> it's not a stick. <laughs> I could make it into a stick though. Um, and I turned away and when I looked up, someone dropped their ladder right in front of me. And so there's this step ladder right in front of me and I saw it and I moved the vehicle this way. Really fast and my car you know, really went boom. Now if that was a PT Cruiser or the Plymouth Voyager or a little van, that thing would have flipped. Because when you're going 65 miles an hour, it's pretty fast. And, and, and I felt the car go like this, right? But because it's lower, the suspension, it actually was, was able to just keep track on the road. And then I came back in, but that was when I, my tire hit the tip of the ladder and pushed it up to the side there. Now I could go, wow, I was lucky. Whew, man, you know, I, I'm just a skillful driver. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, my senses are just honed in. I, my reflect, uh, reflexes are great. And, you know, I could just go through all that. Or I could just say, God, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That was close. That was close. And after it was all done, I was like, oh, man, I missed it, Lord. I could have gone home to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we think. And that's how Pharaoh's thinking here. You know that permeates through our lives in everything, right? The way that we approach things. And the way you, that maybe you even approach church. Maybe some of you that have been here a long time, or, or I don't think we have those here anymore. But you sit there for a while and then you just start thinking, you know, well, maybe God's not here anymore. And you let the enemy lie to you. Maybe he's not doing anything here anymore. And the enemy lies to you. He lies to you because he wants to discourage you. He wants you to leave. He wants you to move on because there's something 
always greener on the other side until you get there and you go through the same thing again. But that's how he works. And, and we need to get rid of that negative thinking and just think God is working here. I see it every single day in the little miracles that are happening. <clears throat> when I counsel with someone, that they would come here, that they'd even want to listen to me, that would have a heart to serve. Um, when you see someone who's homeless and needs food, and you <clears throat> give it to them, and they put a smile on their face. You know, you see God just being glorified there. And that's what was taking place in Pharaoh, you know, life. Oh, call God. Have him stop this. And then when it stops, oh, never mind. I'm not letting him go. Forget it. What are you going to do now? Huh? Well, he sends a third plague, lice. Verse 16 through 19. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land <laughs> so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. You thought the frogs were a lot. Wait till I strike the dust. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hands with his rod and struck the dust of the earth and it became lice on man and beast. And all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. I like the word worked. They must have been sweating. They must have been chanting. They must have been like like with Elijah and, and the, the, the idolatry worshippers calling on their gods. They started cutting themselves, thinking that their god would hear them. You know, these guys were probably working really hard at trying to create lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard. And he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. Like that word. This is the finger of God. The finger of God. The finger of God That they're talking about is a metaphor to say it's God's work. And this is Moses' God that is working in. And this is the last time that we will see these magicians. That they've had it. They're done with it. They realize that this is God himself. And like Emilio, who said in Acts concerning the disciples and the apostles and the Christian faith, look, if, if, this, is, if this is God, then we're fighting against God. And how we can we fight against God? There's nothing we can do if it's God. It was the finger of God that wrote on the tablets of stone. Moses went up there, and God gave him ten commandments, and God wrote with his finger on the tablets. Amazing. It was the finger of God that wrote on Belshazzar's yeah. wall. He had been weighed in the balance and found wanting. The finger of God. It was the finger of God that wrote in the dust, causing the accusers of the woman caught in adultery to drop the stones that they would have hurled at her. That blows me away. And it, could it be that it really had no meaning but to say that God himself is forgiving this woman as he wrote out the sins, possibly, of, of all of those men? Because Jesus wrote in the dust and if it's the finger of God, then Jesus is God. And only he can forgive sin, but he can also condemn sin. Exactly. As he wrote it out. Thus the finger of God either points at you in judgment, or it calls you to forgiveness and salvation. That's the finger of God. A hard heart, my second point. <clears throat> can a Christian become... Heart-hearted. Yes, of course. The Bible considers the heart to be the hub of human personality. And it can become hard. We've all experienced it from time to time. We've experienced it in grief. We are grieving over someone, which is a hard heart. It's hardened from the pain and the suffering that you're going through, and so you grieve. Or even desires, or joys, or understanding, thoughts, and reasoning. And most importantly, faith and belief. These are all products of the heart. 
a matter of the heart. And this heart is sensitive, and it can become hardened. And when it does become hardened, we need to deal with it. Jesus tells us that the heart is a respiratorial of good and evil, and that what comes out of the mouth, good or bad, begins in the heart. So whatever comes out of this mouth is in the heart. Sometimes we need to not speak because God is watching and hearing what comes out of the mouth. And if we speak, then say something good, something edifying, something that's going to encourage. So it's easy to see how a hardened heart can dull a person's ability to perceive and even to understand as it gets hurt. Anyone's heart can harden, even faithful Christians. Sin causes hearts to grow hard, especially as you continue to sin and you're in an unrepentant mode. You don't repent, but you continue to sin. You fall into it and your heart becomes hard to the Spirit of God. And we know that if we confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But if we don't do that, then you begin to quench the Spirit and our hearts become hard to the Lord. A hardened heart is fruit from a broken heart. A heart that's been hurt or is in pain or realizes that the sin is so big that they have no power over it. The heart is broken. And it can become hardened. And it gets hardened first to God, by the way. It's always Him first. We might think that, that, that it's that individual, it's that situation, but it's not. It's hardened to God first because you're hardening your heart to Him. Because what God wants to do in your life, He wants to humble you. He wants to teach you. And give you character. But he must break the hardened heart. And so you get bitter. You get angry. You get upset. And we have no right to do any of those things. Because we have sinned. We have fallen short. We have hurt others. And we need to walk in humility. <coughs> Paul writes about God's wrath. In his letter to the Romans. Where we see that. Godless and wicked men who suppress the truth are eventually given over to their sinful desires and their hardened hearts. He gives them over. Pride will also cause our hearts to harden. This is the root of Pharaoh's heart hardness. Heartness was his pride and his arrogance, and he would not let the people go. Hearts can also become hardened when we suffer setbacks and disappointments in life. And no one is immune to the trials on this earth. Yet, and hopefully we see that our faith being strengthened by the trials we encounter in the valleys of life, as Paul encouraged the Romans, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So we pray daily to our Lord, asking to open up our eyes and to remove our hardened hearts. Teach us the lessons. God is more concerned about you than he is about those that have hurt you. I don't know if that makes sense to you. God allows people in your life so that he can refine you. In order to refine gold, you must put it under a fire. And when the fire is hot enough and it begins to melt the precious metals, the impurities rise to the top. And a good goldsmith will take his little scoop and take the impurities and toss it away and you have the pure gold. And so thus, 
they tell you you have 99.9999% pure gold. But there's always a little dos in it somewhere. And see, God is working in your life because he wants you to be the person that he has created you to be. So that we're not judgmental in a negative way. I'm not saying we can't have judgments because we can. But in a negative way. So that we don't harden our hearts to the Lord and to others. And we allow him to, to work. I was talking to a pastor and he was telling me that his heart was hurt in his church. And he literally, he literally disappeared. He would come and teach, and he would just leave. And he said he did this for several years. Because it, was, it hurt so bad. And there was a point where the Lord finally opened up his eyes and said, this isn't about you. It's about me. And he realized that he had built a wall. Not to, not to those people that hurt him, but to the people that love him and care about him. He wasn't there for them to shepherd them. And so he had to change things. That's what a hardened heart will do. And so God is working things out in your life, and we need to receive that. Pharaoh hardens his heart. So the fourth plague, flies. Who loves, I don't know anybody who loves flies. Flies leave mess. They leave messes all over the place, right? There's this little black spot, right? From regurgitating. And then they put it there and they come back and revisit. When I worked for Southern California Edison, I was like, I know, oh, right? Oh, it's gross. You see the movie The Fly? <laughs> <laughs> when I worked for Southern California Edison, I would go to the dairies. That's where the flies are. That's where the dung is at. <laughs> and those flies land on you. I have a rule in my house, keep my door closed because I hate flies in my room. Well, there's two flies in there today. And I'm trying to study and they're buzzing around my nose. And I'm trying to get them. And then now I'm spending time chasing the flies. <laughs> and they're, and they're, you know, magazine. But I go work out in the dairies. And you know your electric meter, and you can see how it spins around. You can see the numbers, you know, Westinghouse, you know, or Samsung, whatever, whatever it is, GTE. Well, I go to the dairy, and you can't see anything. It's covered with fly stuff. I mean, completely covered. You can't see a thing. Mm. So they send us out there, and we just take the Windex, and we just start spraying it, and just just melts. And then we got to take a, a, a what is it, a Scotch pan. Scrub it all and get rid of it. And within a couple of months, they're right back again. <laughs> so you can imagine the flies here in Egypt, as Moses said, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out of the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me or else. If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and on your people and into the houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. So is God trying to make a point with Pharaoh? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Notice it's swarms of flies. We don't know what kind of flies. I don't even know if there's anyone that studies flies. I'm sure there is. And I'm sure there's hundreds of different types of flies. Because you see big horse flies and then tiny little flies, you know, and they're all different. And this is swarms of them. So there's multitudes of different types of flies that are just coming in and infiltrating all of Pharaoh's kingdom and bed and so forth. Because you can imagine not just the buzzing of the flies in the ears and in the nose and in the air... But the stuff they're leaving behind, too, on you. You would think that would wake you up. You would hope that would wake you up, but it really didn't. Verse 23, I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this shall be a sign. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into the servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. And the land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice 
to your God in the land. So in this, Pharaoh suggested a little compromise. Tell you what, let's do this. I'll allow you a day for you to go and sacrifice, but you cannot leave. But Moses said, it is not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then will they not stone us? So what is he talking about there, abominations? Well, the Egyptians really didn't care for, for lamb sacrifices. They didn't like sheep herds, really. And that's why they sent them off to the land of Goshen. You remember there was a little problem with that. Don't tell them what you do. You know, you herd sheep. So tell them that you work with cattle, things like that. It was an abomination to them. And Moses says, no, no, if we go do that, your people's going to see us. And there's plenty of you. And they're going to want to stone us and kill us. So that's not going to happen. We're not going to allow that. No, you're going to completely let them go. He says, we will go three days, journey into the wilderness, verse 27, and sacrifice the Lord our God as he will command us. I love that. As he will command us. God will command us. God is the one in control here, Pharaoh. And he, as he commands us, we will follow him. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Intercede for me. He calls out for God a second time. Interesting. And then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you, and I will entreat the Lord, intercede for you, that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh and from your servants and from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the words of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people, not one, not one remained. Not one remained. One did fly swipe. And Pharaoh's hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from this point on, the people were separated. Israelites were not affected by the plagues from this point on. And we don't see the magicians anymore. Now God is dealing with Pharaoh himself without any soothsayers, magic tricks, that only work to a certain point. But he's dealing with God himself, and God's going to show Pharaoh that he is God and that he can actually separate his people from his people. So my last point here is a separated people. The Jews were a separated people. A Christian's heart should be a set up heart heart for his or her God. We should purposely set our hearts apart for God. What do you mean by that? Well, we should desire God. As a husband desires his wife, as a wife desires her husband, so we must desire our God. And we set ourselves apart for God. In other words, we no longer walk and live in the world, but now we want to walk in the kingdom of God and serve God and love God. I've spent 30 years of my 55 years as a Christian. 30 years being a Christian. Trying to separate myself from the very beginning when I got saved, to separate myself from this world unto God. From day one, it was a zeal that God gave me. And I dove right into it, full body, and I haven't stopped since. There's been a lot of distractions, there's been a lot of pain, there's been a lot of suffering, but I continue to until the day that I die, and I'm not going to stop, no matter what. Because we have been called to separate ourselves unto God. And it is a decision that we decide to make. When it comes to being set apart for God, know that it, is, it cannot be done on our own efforts. It is a work that is done by the Holy Spirit. You definitely have to be saved by God's grace. And that grace that has been given to you has to amazingly change you. Because you realize what a wretch that I am. When I was in this world, and yet God 
loved me enough to send his son to die on the cross in my place. That's amazing grace. That he would do something like that. We must repent from our sins. And we must trust in God alone for salvation. There's no question about that at all. God desires perfection. And Jesus died on the cross and became that perfection on our behalf. We can't go back to when we used to live in sexual sin, drunkenness, wild parties, and anything that goes against the Bible. That's what you came out of. Why would you go back to it? We have separated ourselves and said, Lord, we no longer want to live in sexual sin. And yet you find believers living with each other before they're married. That shouldn't be. It's not what God wants. You have asked him to come into your life and separate you from this world. And that's probably going to be the first thing he's going to say that you need to change. And you need to stop drinking. Or at least stop getting drunk. And stop stumbling people by drinking in front of them. Or posting it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Your wine glass there for everyone to see. You know, have a little bit of respect for morality at least. And wild parties. And anything that goes against the word of God. We don't live for man. We live for God now as believers. Being set apart from the world doesn't mean we can't have fun. I probably have more fun now than I ever did before. I'm actually wide awake and not drunk that I can actually understand and see what it <laughs> like, What happened last night? Because it must have been fun, but I don't remember any of it. <laughs> At least now I can remember it. I love going fishing with the guys at Bishop and catching the biggest fish from everyone else. <laughs> that thing was huge. That's fun to me. Fellowshipping and sitting around and just joking around with each other. <laughs> Some of the things the guys do to each other while they're up there. You know, guys, they just they get older, but they're still children. <laughs> yep. They're still children. I'm just glad they respect me enough not to get me involved. <laughs> That's no fun. <laughs> I get to watch it all and hear all the stories in our life. We're not to indulge in the things that are contrary to the word of God like the fake Christians of this world who live like unbelievers. They call themselves Christians, but yet they live like unbelievers. You can't tell them apart. You can't tell them apart at all. The world likes to smoke weed. We shouldn't like to smoke weed. And that's a big issue today, isn't it? Because we've legalized it. And so it must be okay now. And so we're taking advantage of that and using... The fact that it's a medical prescription that we can get to smoke it. Now, I totally understand. There's some things that I believe, but I'm not going to share them right now. But it's interesting how we're taking this and we're just going out and saying, hey, let's smoke weed. What's the big deal? I needed to calm down. I needed to relax and so forth. The world is infiltrated with materialism while others are in need. We don't live like that. We are to be generous and not just think of ourselves. You know, we talked about this on Monday night. How we are not to play favorites with the rich, but we're actually to favor the poor. And we talked about possibly giving to a point where it's a sacrifice. And we should. And I don't know if you've ever given to a point where it was a sacrifice where it cost you something but it is the greatest thing to give like that and to see God do something wonderful with it it's an amazing thing David said David said I will not give to the Lord unless it hurts me and, and that's what Jesus told the religious leaders oh you tithe but you tithe out of your wealth you got so much you know like someone said you know Trump gave uh, what a million dollars to the hurricane in Texas, right? And then someone says, yeah, but he's so rich, that's nothing to him. You're right, at least he gave something. What did you give? Mm -hmm. What did you give? 
million dollars is nothing, but it's something. But give me maybe a hundred dollars and you don't even have it. That's what we do for believers. We're not we're infiltrated with this materialism. Let your light so shine before others because God has chosen you out of the world to show his glory through you. You're in the world, but you're not to be a part of the world. Don't follow the world's desires and live like unbelievers and walk like Jesus, but walk like Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That's how we are supposed to walk. We are a separated people. The word, the theological word is sanctified. We are set apart or consecrated is another word you've heard before. We are consecrated unto the Lord. Just as Jesus was unto his work, so we are to our work. So let me close. The Lord sent these plagues, frogs, lice, and flies, and Pharaoh begged for relief twice, but he hardened his heart, and God will continue to send his plagues. So we'll see what happens next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray, Lord, that your word would go forth, Father, and not return void. Lord, that you would create in us a hunger and a desire for you, Lord. To love you and to put you first in our lives above all things, Lord Jesus. And Lord, that we may truly reflect the glory of God because we are separated. We are separated unto God and for his work, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.